Good morning. Thank you for all of you for joining us here at the Bipartisan Policy Center for a discussion with CBO Director uh, Phil Swagel and his recently released budget and economic outlook from 2023 to 2033. I'm Bill Hoagland here with the Bipartisan Policy Center. I have the pleasure of working with our economic and health team. We are very pleased to be able to provide this opportunity to discuss the country's economic and budget outlook with Director Swagel. Uh, next year will be the 50th anniversary of the enactment of the Congressional Budget and Impoundment Control Act. Um, that act established two new congressional committees, the House and the Senate Budget Committees, and the Congressional Budget Offices. I will always consider it an honor to have been one of the early employees of the CBO under the first director, the late great Alice Rivlin. In the last 50 years, there has been only 10 directors, Dr. Swagel being the 10th uh, beginning his career there in uh, 2019. He previously served as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy. He played an important role in the Troubled Asset Relief Program that was part of the U.S. government's response to the financial crisis in 2007 and 2008. Importantly for me, he was a co-chair here at the Bipartisan Policy Center's Financial Regulatory Reform Initiative. His background, his education is at Princeton and Harvard. Over the last recent years, the budget process has come under criticism. One key requirement of that 74 Act was to have Congress adopt annually a budget blueprint, a concurrent budget resolution for the upcoming fiscal year. In the 50 year history, Congress has failed to achieve that outcome 12 times, 11 times here in the 21st century, most recently by not even adopting a budget for the 2023, the fiscal year we're in right now. But I will argue that CBO has, been, has not been the subject to the same criticism leveled against the process. It has consistently spoken truth to power, not always an easy task in this town. It has annually produced a forecast of the country's fiscal future designed to set a baseline for Congress to use in developing a budget. CBO is strictly nonpartisan, conducts objective and impartial analysis. So there's much to discuss in CBO's report today. And who better to lead that discussion than Heather Long? Heather is a columnist and member of the Washington Post editorial board. She was formerly U.S. Uh, economics and correspondent from 2017 to 21 for the Post, and she played a large role in identifying and covering the K-shaped recovery from the pandemic. Importantly, Heather was one of the first columnists to discuss and focus on not a, on a labor shortage coming out of COVID, but as she penned it, a great reassessment of work. Uh, trained at Wellesley College and Oxford University. Heather, we are so pleased that you're able to join us and to conduct a, a discussion with Dr. Swagel. So turning it over to you, Heather. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, there is much to discuss. Um, Phil, I'll kick it off to you if you wanna just give a brief overview of what is the most noteworthy from this new report that had a lot to digest. Okay, no, thank you. Thanks so much, Heather and, and, and Bill and BPC. Thanks so much for having me on and having me back, as you said. Um, so um, our 10-year budget and economic projections that we released uh, this past Wednesday afternoon indicate a challenging situation. So for 2023 this year, our economic forecast has stagnant output and declining output in the first half of the year, moderately rising unemployment, gradually slowing inflation and interest rates that remain high um, while inflation comes down. And then the, the economy subsequently rebounds. Um, as this happens, spending substantially exceeds revenues in our projections. And this is the, even though the pandemic related spending lessens and the economy, you know, has substantially rebounded from the pandemic induced recession. And so of course the resulting deficits increase the government's debt. And you, you can see that in the charts in our report. Now, Servicing that debt becomes a rising burden. The resources paid out to our lenders, these are net interest payments, including the foreign owners of treasury securities, are not available for other priorities. And those rise considerably over time, both as a share of GDP and in nominal dollars. And so these debt payments, that's what I, I would point to as the you know, immediate uh, challenge facing us, that these rising debt payments 
crowd out other activities, whether someone wants to address the deficit, whether one, someone wants additional tax relief or increased spending for any purpose, for national security, for social needs, uh, anything, um, rising debt payments will, will pose a challenge for that. And then the, there's a longer term challenge and that longer term challenge shows up now within the 10 year budget window. So the social security trust fund in our projections is exhausted in 2032 within the 10 year window. Now social security benefits would be more than 20% smaller than scheduled if outlays are limited to what is payable after the trust fund exhaustion. So there's a sense in which doing nothing does not preserve social security, but affects the benefits that are uh, able to be paid out. And so the, the, the bottom line is that changes in fiscal policy must be made to address the rising costs of interest payments, the imbalance between spending um, and revenue, and to mitigate the potential adverse consequences of the high and rising debt. Um, so why don't I stop there? And Heather, I'm looking forward to talking. There's a lot to unpack. There is such a sense of urgency throughout this report. Uh, of course, the most urgent one, I know we're calling this beyond the debt limit, but on so many people's minds is that X date when we would potentially not have enough money for the U.S. government to pay all the bills. You all say it could be any time between July and September. Um, can you just summarize for people across this nation how disastrous is it if we go beyond that X date? Okay, no, uh, very good, thank you. And, and thanks for mentioning that as well, that uh, on Wednesday afternoon at the same time as we, we released our budget and economic update, we put out a short report, an update of a recurring report from CBO on the debt limit. And as Heather said, we project a, a three month window of when, when um, the extraordinary measures being undertaken by the treasury are exhausted and that's be between July and September. Now there is uncertainty about that. And in particular, um, the tax revenues that we'll see uh, later this year, right? The IRS will get lots of um, payments in April and, and May. It's no surprise people who have refunds tend to elect e-file, people who have payments tend to paper file, um, human nature. So it'll be sometime into May before we have a, a real good sense of the revenues, but that's, that's a lot of the uncertainty. Um, uh, involved with that window. Um, so the debt ceiling, uh, as, as Heather alluded to, would have to be raised for the U.S. government to continue paying its, um, you know, its bills. And these, of course, the bills that have been already uh, incurred. You know, what would it mean for the U.S. economy? It would dep depend on the circumstances. There have been technical problems in the past where the payments are, you know, there's a day or something where, um, you know, while well, things are getting sorted out. That would be one situation, a prolonged um, you know, a prolonged period going past the debt, the debt ceiling, the exhaustion date would be very challenging and uh, affect the financial markets in the U.S. and global markets and, and the economy more broadly. Well, that seems pretty tame. Uh, let me just ask one more and then we'll move on. But um, how feasible is it if we do go past this date, whenever that date occurs, to prioritize payments. There's starting to be talk of be prioritized you know, payments to credit hold bondholders or payments to, for social security and these types of things. Everybody has their priority list. Um, do you think realistically that's an option or is that still going to be seen as a default to the US government not paying its bills? Oh, okay. I mean, it's, you know, look, it's technically feasible to prioritize payments in that way. Now, technically, is, technically I, I guess I really mean theoretically, because the work to actually make that happen would have to be um, un undertaken by the Treasury, which has a super professional staff um, uh, you know, in, in the Fiscal Bureau to, um, you know, to, to do these things, but it would be a challenging, tech, you know, technologically challenging. Um, you know, and, and our, I should just say our projections are based on the um, expectation, the assumption that the U.S. government continues to pay its bills if the debt ceiling is raised. So that's the way I would think of it. It's, you know, in principle, it's feasible. Technologically, it's challenging. And then, of course, one would have to make lots of decisions about, well, which payments to prior prioritize. And those, are, it's, you know, both, you know, technologically challenging and, and philosophically difficult. Yeah. Um, I just want to give you one more chance if there's something that you'd like to say to urge lawmakers to make sure they do raise the debt ceiling on time. You're just one of the few 
nonpartisan voices as CBO director. It's probably you and Fed Chair Powell, <laughs> and, and, and who I know you know well. And, and when he had the chance in his latest press conference, he was unequivocal. He said, there's only one way forward here, and that's for Congress to raise the debt ceiling. And I wondered, how would you put it in your words? Uh, I mean, you know, a sentence that starts with, as Chair Powell said, is a good, you know, and from my perspective, is a good sentence, right? I'm always going to agree with that sentence. So um, you know, with whatever follows. So, um, uh, you know, for, from the CBO perspective, we're here to support the we are here to support the Congress. And part of that is we provide them with analysis and not our opinion, right? We don't, you know, we don't tell them you should do this, you should do that. Sometimes we'll give them several options or many options. We won't say do this one thing. And so that's the only reason I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hesitating here to tell the Congress what to do. That is just beyond, in some sense, it's beyond the line for CBO, even though, I, of course, I, I, um, you know, uh, have spelled out the consequences of um, going past the debt ceiling. All right. Thanks, Phil. Let me just pause and say um, to anyone watching and joining us, we are eager to hear your questions. I've got a long list, but uh, you can submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag BPC Live for Bipartisan Policy Center Live, and we will ask them throughout this hour. Uh, okay, so moving to the big budget picture, let's hopefully we can get past whatever craziness this summer and, and move on from the debt limit discussion and what you all have outlined in this latest report is really alarming. Uh, I know it's kind of a cheesy exercise, but kind of on a scale of one to 10, how concerned should Americans be right now uh, about the nation's fiscal picture that you're outlining? Okay, no, I think that's a good exercise um, uh, in, in you know, how alarmed. And the way I think of it is over different time horizons. So in the near term, the U.S. government and policymakers have the ability to undertake further policy. So if policymakers wanted to do you know, something that involved fiscal policy, whether it's spending more on our national security, spending more on social uh, issues, further tax relief, as a nation, we have the ability, we have the capacity to do that. And so the, the fiscal challenge is one that's over time. And that's, that's what I meant by the, the rising you know, flow burden, as I think of it, of, of net interest payments. That just starts to crowd out other things and make, other, make things challenging, make the decisions more difficult. It's not like you know, next year there has to be action or things go, you know, go crazy. It's, there's a rising challenge that has to be addressed over time. There's not a particular moment when, um, you know, when, when sort of we, we cross a red line. Yeah, I think you described it on Wednesday. It's not like the wily e. coyote that runs off of the cliff and suddenly falls. It's, it's much more of the boiling frog analogy, perhaps, where it just gets worse and worse over time and it's hard to know. I know that, that's good. And um, I'm thinking I need a new metaphor than wily e. coyote, so I might use the frog. All right. <laughs> Um, well, talk to us a little bit. A lot of headlines other than the debt limit were about your projection that over the next decade, you all like to talk in your 10-year window, that the United States is on track to add $19 trillion to our debt. Um, and that that is about $3 trillion more than what you were predicting in May. So a pretty substantial increase, even from less than a year ago, what we were talking about. Explain to us what's in that extra $3 trillion. How did How do you end up adding that amount? Uh, okay, no, very good. And it's a mix of, um, uh, of things happening. And you can see in our reports so on, the on the CBO website, we have um, a visual summary that gives some of the key charts. And that's, if I remember, it's the second chart in the key summary that goes through this $3.1 trillion over 10 years in additional de uh, deficits. And so we break it out into three components and I'll, I'll go through those really quickly. So first is legislative changes that our, our last update was May of 2022, so last May. Um, and since then, there's been lots of legislation enacted. The biggest component of that adding to the 10-year deficit are additional benefits for veterans. And this is the, the PACT Act that established the Toxic Exposure Fund. Um, and um, well, as you say, one of your um, uh, competing newspapers has an article that goes through some of those budget issues uh, to today. Um, and you can notice from the CBO perspective, 
we are saying, well, here's how much it costs, but there's no, there, there's no implication that it's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, good things can cost money, bad things can cost money. It's, you know, that's, and again, that's part of CBO provides analysis and not opinion. That's, that's for policymakers who do. So that, that's the main, the, by far the biggest piece of legislation. And that's 1.5 trillion of the 3.1. And if someone is someone watching this, go to our website, open up the visual summary, and you'll see the chart I'm, uh, I'm, I'm meant, you know, sort of talking through here. Um, second is economic reasons. And, you know, we have a different economic forecast. In particular, there's higher inflation and higher interest rates than we saw uh, last year when we, when we finalized our forecast in February 2022. Now, um, we, back then we had high inflation, but inflation has turned out to be yet higher and much more persistent than we expected um, a, a, a more than a year ago. Um, so what does that mean for the federal government? Well, part of it is the net interest payments that I talked about before, right? Higher interest rates mean that the, the federal government is paying more to service its debt. Now, of course, there's existing debt, right? The federal government doesn't just borrow 30 days at a time. We, you know, as a nation, we borrow for 30 years, we borrow for 10 years, there's, there's different maturities of treasury bonds. But as the treasury bonds mature, and as the new borrowing comes on and we have additional borrowing, um, those, those bonds are rolled over into higher interest rates and that, that means higher payments. And so that's, you know, that, that's in our um, uh, projections. And then higher inflation means higher payments from the federal government for lots of things. There's Social Security, for example. You know, uh, you know on the one hand, beneficiaries benefit from the COLA. You know, there's a, a record COLA, it's eight, eight, you know, over 8%. On the other hand, that's a consequence of high inflation. We, I think we've learned as a nation that high inflation is very damaging. It's um, in it's, it's a sense like a, it's a tsunami that affects the entire nation, um, you know, in a way that other negative economic effects don't. So, yeah. Um, yeah so that's so that's high inflation. Does that? And there's lots of other things that the federal government pays for that are um, involved. You know, that that cost more because of higher inflation. And then just quickly, the last the last piece of it is um, revenues. So revenues went up, and so that reduces the 10-year cost by 900 billion, by 0.9 trillion. Um, and again, higher inflation means higher nominal wages, higher nominal GDP, and we tax that nominal GDP, so higher inflation results in higher revenues. There's some other changes that are more technical, but those are the main components. Yeah, and it really struck me that when you all were outlining, basically about half of it was coming from legislative changes, that many of those changes were bipartisan. There's often a push to blame one side or another, but a lot of this is, is bipartisan. Uh, um, yep. So I, um, I want to ask you a little bit about these economic changes. Obviously, there's been a very different picture in the economy. Certainly, I believe you were last at the Bipartisan Policy Center doing a talk in 2021 and what a different economy we're talking about now, particularly on the inflation side. Um, but looking at your forecast for this year, is CBO forecasting a recession in 2023? Uh, so our forecast has negative GDP growth, just kind of modestly negative GDP growth in the first half of the year. And that's driven by the interest sensitive sectors of the economy. And we see that in housing already, business investment, there are signs of, um, uh, of that as well, of decelerating uh, investment. Um, we had strong GDP growth at the end of last year. That was driven largely by the volatile sectors of the economy, by, by trade and by inventory swings. Um, it, you know, it's reasonable to expect the inventory swing not to happen again. So that, you know, that that factor supporting stronger GDP growth, you know, is not likely to recur. And then the the trade part was a contraction of imports, which mechanically or arithmetically leads to higher GDP growth, but it's probably not a good sign of the underlying strength of the of the economy. So that's that's what we have in the first half of the year. Then we go recovery. Um, you know, the CBO doesn't call recessions. So I'm, you know, I'm not saying, oh yeah, we think there's a recession. In part, of course, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a recession in the first half of the year, even if I were calling them, is the job market remains very tight. And we saw that in the January data. Um, and you know, we, we've seen that previously, that the, the job market is tight and wages are growing. And so it, in some sense, it's it's just a mixed picture in the economy right now. 
Yeah, I mean, I was struck looking at your forecast. You're obviously at the moment forecasting unemployment to potentially rise from its current level of 3.4% up to potentially 5.1% um, in the coming year or so. Uh, as you mentioned, a lot of economic data lately from jobs to retail sales uh, has been hot, hot, hot. Uh, do you see more upside risk to your forecast at the moment? Uh, okay, no, very good. And wait, I can mention someone in the post is your your colleague Catherine Rampell had a really nice column that went through some of these cross currents um, in in the data. Um, uh, you know, so we we locked down our forecast, our economic forecast, in early December, and that's it's just part of our process. We have to because the the way our budget projections are done are from the bottom up, and so the the analyst. Um, you know, my colleague who's the analyst on on say SNAP benefits, what people think of as food stamps. It has to have a projection for future food prices. And then it's a, it's a she, she goes through and, um, uh, you know, says, okay, given the food prices, given the unemployment rate trajectory and so on, here's what we're going to project out spending on, on uh, SNAP benefits and, and other things like that. So that's where we have to lock down our forecast early. Since then, we've had, well, as Catherine Rampell notes, a cross current of data. And so GDP growth at the end of the year was strong, but driven by these special factors and you know, others have noted that you know, sort of the underlying details are a bit, you know, not quite as, as strong as the headline. Um, inflation has come in a, a bit lower than our forecast, but not by a whole lot. And, and so on. Retail sales this month or this month in January, the data we got uh, this month. So January retail sales were, were very strong. The prior two months were, were pretty modest. Um, so there's this cross current. I think on the whole, our forecast is still pretty good that the first half of the year is going to be weak. Inflation's higher than the Fed's target for an extended time, but coming down and interest rates look to remain uh, high. So I think, uh, again, broadly speaking, we're, we're in good shape, but, um, you know, obviously there's going to be lots of details that will change. Yeah. You know, it's, um, the Bipartisan Policy Center and Bill Hoagland have pointed out that the term word uncertainty appears mm. more than 70 times in your latest report. And we didn't go back and look if that's the most ever, but it certainly feels like a lot more frequent use of uncertainty in a CBO report than we might normally see. Um, why is that? Yeah, it's a perceptive observation. Um, it, it, cyclical turning points in the economy are difficult. And our projection in some sense has that cyclical turning point with a weak economy and then a, a, a rebound. And there's so much going on in, in across different sectors of the economy that lends that uncertainty. Health, the science, there's the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, energy, um, there's so much. And so we wanted to spell that out. And so if you look in our um, budget uh, budget and economic outlook is chapter two has the economy. We start with the budget and projections and then do the economy. And we, the way we wrote it was, here's our projection, right? We're the one-handed economists. Here's what we think. And then the next section is this, you know, dozens of uncertainties. Um, and that is just a sign. I think it's a sign of the times. And for your deficit projection, so the, what it, the picture looks like for, say, 2023, you all are now projecting that spending will be higher than revenues by $1.4 So about, um, about $400 billion more than you did before. These numbers are all very big. It's hard to keep track, but uh, $1.4 trillion is what you're thinking now. I was surprised to see, I immediately got some notes from Wall Street analysts, including Goldman Sachs, who were sort of um, thinking that you all were too pessimistic, that the number could be smaller. I'm wondering if you could talk us through what could change the 1.4 trillion. Is it just how tax payments come in? What else are you all watching to see how you refine this estimate? Uh, okay, no, very good. And um... And I should, I, I just want to advertise on our website, we have a one page data summary that if you go, if you go to the cbo.gov, click on the budget outlook, you'll get to the landing page. And one of the products there is this one page summary. So it has, I think every budget, you know, the, the, not every, <laughs> um, my colleagues here will come into my office and, uh, you know, correct me if I say that, but, um, uh, 
it has the top line budget numbers and our economic projection. Um, there's uncertainty on the on the fiscal side as well. So number one, our projections are done under current law. So there are additional fit, uh, additional changes in the law. Well, those would change the fiscal numbers as well. And that could be on the spending side or the revenue side. Um, and then the economy, of course, has a big impact on the fiscal situation. Um, and as we, we said before, um, on the, the, the debt ceiling, it's the same, it's the same thing. So, um, you know, one, maybe I should just highlight one uncertainty in particular, and that's on the revenue, revenue side. As a nation, we had very strong tax revenues over the past couple of years. In 2021 in particular, tax revenues were, were elevated by the rebound from the pan pandemic, elevated by inflation, and yet tax revenues were even stronger, so stronger than would be explained by historical relationships with the economic fundamentals. What we've learned since then, we just learned this in December of last year when we, we got new data from the IRS, is that it was capital gains realizations. So capital gains realizations were extraordinarily strong in 2021, and therefore the tax revenue for those capital gains revenues were very strong in 2022. We had that coming back down to a more normal relationship. And, it, it, you know, it look at the market is strong again, and, um, you know, realizations are strong. Well, that, you know, that, that would be one source of uncertainty. In the other direction, if, if the economy is, even, is weaker than we have, you know, say the Fed needs to tighten interest rates by more than we have, we have two more 25 basis point hikes uh, still to come. But if, if they have to do more, then that could um, go in the other direction. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to kind of dig into different parts of the budget in the next segment here. But first, uh, we had a really good big picture question come in from the audience that I thought I'd throw your way now. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Wendell Primus, and he says, is the deficit problem large enough or substantial enough, however you might want to describe it, that mm -hmm. the president should call for some sort of negotiation, um, much like, say, H.W. Bush did back in 1990? Are we sort of at a point where there needs to be... Yeah. We always hate to have another commission, but is, is this, are we at a moment where we really need to start having a reckoning? Okay, no, thank you. And I'll just give a, a, a thank you to Wendell for asking the question. And, and you know, Wendell, of course, just retired after a very distinguished career, um, you know, most recently with Speaker Pelosi. Um, uh, the, the deficit problem is challenging. It's large, it's challenging. Um, and looking at the, the budget numbers, you know, even the one pager we have is enough to, to indicate the difficulty of adjusting the deficit in, in so this, certainly within the 10-year window, even over a longer period of time. Now, it's, it's of course mathematically possible to make large adjustments. Um, it's just challenging given the, the magnitude of the deficit. So there's a sense in which the current Congress has inherited a very difficult situation, right? Massive structural deficits, even as the economy is rebounded from the pandemic, and an economy that's weakening at the same time. And that's what the current Congress is, uh, is facing, that sort of very difficult inherited uh, situation. You know, what's the right way to do this? Um, you know, that it's a political question. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's not political of me to say, I wouldn't give a political answer, but I think I'm safe to say it, it's something that involves all Americans. And so, um, you know, that it's, it's a bigger discussion than just any one small group of people. And it sounds like you're saying the sooner the better um, to, to work on these issues. I, I, no, I agree with that. The sooner the better in the sense of, right, the longer we wait, the more challenging it gets. And there's, I mean, there's, there's issues of generational fairness here as well. Um, you know, fairness is in the eye of the beholder, of course, but imagine that the eventual solution is meant to impose a fiscal burden on one group and not on all groups. And so I'll, I'll make that less technical. In the future, we, we will either see more revenues than under current law or lower spending than under current law, right? Those are the choices that you could also, I suppose, have stronger growth. If there were actions that we took as a nation that improved growth, and there's a lot, you know, lots of ways we can do that, that would mean stronger growth, stronger revenues, that would help the, the situation as well. So I should say there's, a, there's certainly a third way there. Um, uh, imagine that the the changes on the spending side or the revenue side, you know, are um, distributionally meant to, to affect higher income or, or higher wealth households. Of course, higher wealth households 
typically have higher incomes over their lifetimes. Well, the longer we wait, and again, whether to have higher taxes than under current law or lower spending than under current law, whichever way, and CBO would never tell policymakers which of those to, levers to, to use. Well, that means if we wait, some households are in a sense escaping their share of the burden of that adjustment. Um, and so that's a generational issue. And again, it doesn't, I'm not, I'm not talking about affecting lower income households. If you look in our December 2020 budget options volume, we have budget options affecting everything, spending, revenue, and even in our, our, um, one of our options for, for um, making changes to social security, that involves higher benefits for low income households, households with low lifetime incomes, and lower benefits for households with higher lifetime incomes. And so that's the kind of distributional change one could make. And again, it's just an example in our um, outlook. Um, but waiting means that some income, some households with high lifetime incomes are not share, you know, not having their full share of the burden of that adjustment. Yeah, you put that pretty clearly. Um, and I want to put another plug in for that budget options part of your website. It's really helpful to play around with, to try to figure out your own personal preference for the solution here. But it's it's also sobering when you realize you need quite a few options generally to make the fiscal picture better. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of that, you know, you mentioned the third rail uh, of growth. Could, if we have stronger growth, the stronger economy, that can help improve the outlook a lot. Do you think even if we had phenomenal growth, it would be enough to get us out of our problems, or is it going to take more, more than growth? Uh, okay, now that's, it's a very important question. In our next update coming um, in the spring, we will do more on that. And so, and we, you can see this in past CBO um, budget uh, updates that we do different sensitivity analyses. Well, what if GDP growth is, you know, quite a lot stronger than what we have in our projection? And we do it through productivity, uh, you know, an exogenous in, improvement in productivity, therefore stronger GDP growth. And then, of course, we do it symmetrically. Well, what if it's weaker? And the same thing we do, well, what if interest rates are higher or lower than our, in our um, central projection that we use for the, the budget? Um, and, and that does make a difference, right? So stronger growth definitely helps immensely with the fiscal situation. And the same thing, higher interest rates goes in the opposite direction. And, and we do symmetrically. Um, the fiscal situation is so challenging. And again, what the current Congress has inherited is so challenging that um, stronger growth by itself can go a long way, but the situation is very challenging, you know, even beyond um, what, what growth alone can do. Mm, all right. That helps to put it in perspective. I want to ask you about student debt relief. This is one that I'm surprised didn't get a lot of press, but in your report and in your recent reports, you have noted that um, this cancellation of a portion of student loans, as well as those repayment pauses during the pandemic to try to help give some relief. Um, last year alone, it added over 400 billion to the deficit. And right now we're waiting to see what the Supreme Court will rule on um, some of the president's relief for student loans. The president Biden has also come out with an additional plan to do some potentially more relief on student loans. So there's a lot up in the air right now that seems like it could really impact this year's deficit one way or another, depending upon what happens with this student loan uh, relief and, and forgiveness in some cases. Um, can you talk people through how how big of an impact could this have? Um, sure, and I'll, I'll talk about it in three um, in, in, in three steps. So one is the debt cancellation or the loan forgiveness um, that was announced at the end of September of last year, and that's the end of the fiscal year. So it was late in the 2022 fiscal year the administration booked that already. So that increased the 2022 deficit. We've got that. And, um, uh, you know, we did our own estimate that was somewhat higher than what the administration estimated. You know, we, we saw that the take up of that student loan, um, uh, the, the debt cancellation as higher than the administration said. Essentially the administration is giving people $20,000. We thought that would be quite attractive, more attractive I think than they did. Um, and so we have we have a higher cost. 
but they booked it at 397 billion. That's in the 2022 numbers. And so that's, that's in, that's not a projection, that's already booked. It's in front of the Supreme Court, they're having arguments later this month. If the Supreme Court were to you know, nix that cancellation and say, no, it's not, not constitutional, um, uh, then the future deficits would be lower as a result, right? We wouldn't go back and change the 2022 deficit, that's history, there'd be a technical uh, adjustment, uh, an adjustment that would fall into the te technical category of the changes, um, which would mechanically decrease the, um, the deficit by that amount. Now there's complications because the, as you said, the administration has another proposal, which would be changes to the income driven repayment. And that's in some sense, a, an after the fact change in individual borrowers payments. So is someone with a relatively high, um, uh, high, high income would tend to pay more of their student loans back. Someone with a lower or moderate in, uh, income would pay less of their student loans back. We are still analyzing that. And that the administration announced their um, final rule for that only after we had locked down our budget projections. So it's not in, it's not in what we've done. Um, when we have, I, I'm pretty sure by the spring update, we'll finish our analysis of that. And that interacts with the um, Supreme Court decision, because if the Supreme Court says no to the administration's um, nearly $400 billion of, of debt cancellation, um, then that would mean there's more debt to be forgiven. And so the cost of the, you know, the, the newer program would be higher. And so we're, we're going to watch, of course, what the Supreme Court does, and we'll adjust our projections. Uh, let me just add, I know this, I've gone a bit long on student loans, but there's a lot going on. And I'll just say there's one more thing that's that's interesting. The administration over the past um, several months has undertaken a series of other actions involving student loans that tend to have the um, effect of increasing forgiveness for different populations. And those are also tens of billions of dollars involved in some of them. So altogether, those come to nearly a hundred billion dollars beyond the cancellation and beyond the income driven repayment. And so those are in our projections now of um, you know, that additional nearly $100 billion of um, you know, various executive actions. Mm. There's obviously a lot going on. And as you've outlined, uh, it's, uh, CBO is gonna have a challenging time um, figuring all, sorting all this out. Um, I'm curious, it gets very political student loans. I know you don't wanna go there, but if like stepping back and thinking more big picture, is there anything you could say on how the ongoing problems in the United States with college affordability are, are impacting our, our budget picture and impacting our fiscal health. Is there kind of a bigger picture takeaway that, that isn't really political here, but just a reality? Ah, uh, it's a good question. I'm sorry, I'm looking off to the, the ceiling here. Um, I have in my office, I'm, I'm, oh, you can see I'm sitting in my office and in front of my monitor, is a, um, a photo of Half Dome. I grew up in, in Southern California and you know, been to Yosemite many times. So I have a picture of Half Dome. Um, uh, it's inspiration and challenge. Um, I've never gotten to the, never hiked up the top of Half Dome. Um, uh, you know, this, so this is a big picture challenge and maybe the, the kind of big picture way to think about it is the, the fiscal situation is a long-term issue. And so there's a sense in which um, student loans or pensions um, you know, other things are promises made today that have fiscal implications over time. Um, and, and, you know, one thing that's, um, I think, apparent in what's happening with student loans is that the changes that the president has made uh, do not ch change the underlying system, right? So the, what's, you know, the, the forgiveness with student loans is in some sense a, a react, perhaps a reaction to the rising um, cost of higher education. And the, the president's actions don't change that. So there's a sense in which those actions, you know, if the court has them go through or if the, if the you know, uh, other things he's proposed uh, continue, you know, continue um, those would ameliorate the difficulty for current borrowers, but future borrowers would face a, a challenging situation. And, you know, student loans have, most borrowers have not repaid, have not been paying their loans since the pandemic, right? That was first in the statute, and then it was continued without a statutory basis. So the current borrowers who are getting the, the forgiveness, it says that they, they haven't faced a challenge during the pandemic. Now, obviously, well, I shouldn't say that. that's, that's way too broad. 
right? All of us have faced health challenges and social challenges, educational challenges, um, you know, many severe challenges. So the, the financial challenge of student loans has been put on hold uh, through the pandemic. And so the cancellation is coming to, is it to, to help people who have not, have not faced that one dimension of a financial challenge. Um, you know, what do we do about the future, right? We're not changing the system. And that means future borrowers will be in a similar situation. And that, you know, obviously that's, it's a policy challenge, it's a political challenge, it's a social challenge um, of how to deal with that. Yeah, so much of this comes down to that intergenerational fairness question you keep bringing up and it's, it's a difficult discussion. Um, I want to move on to Social Security and Medicare, which was a big part of your latest report. Um, obviously, anyone who watched the State of the Union noticed that one of the few moments that Democrats and Republicans seemed to have agreement was that they wouldn't didn't want to make changes to Social Security and Medicare, this notion of a hands-off uh, of those programs. Uh, your latest CBO report... Um, it's pretty clear what happens if no changes are made. Uh, can you lay it out for us? What would happen? Um, uh, yes, I, I, I'll say it. Um, that under current law and under our projection, the Social Security Trust Fund would be exhausted in 2032. So that's within the 10-year budget window. Now, the Social Security Trust Fund is, in, in a sense, is a way for us as a government and as a society to account for the past surpluses in Social Security. Social, Social Security is running a, a cash deficit today. The outlays of, of benefits are greater than the, the contributions, the revenues coming into the system. But in the past, there were um, uh, there were surpluses, and so we've we've counted those surpluses. We've credited those surpluses with interest at the Treasury rate, um, and the, the benefits today are being paid in full as promised, eh, drawing down on the Social Security Trust Fund. And so in 2032, those past surpluses, the accumulation of those past surpluses, again, this is an accounting, it's, it's best to think of it as, as an accounting way, we will have gone through all of those surpluses, right? There's no assets, there's just a, a legal authority for the, the Treasury to, to, um, to, to borrow through general revenues and, um, and, and pop up the, the income of Social Security to pay full promise benefits. You know, so in some is different is someone thinks of like a company with a pension fund or a, like a state governor with a pension fund and they're gonna invest it in lots of different things. That Social Security is, is, is different than that. Um, you know, we're, we're drawing on general revenues. So um, that is, is, that's the challenge. And then when, when the statutory authority to pay full benefits is exhausted in our projections in 2032, the income of Social Security would be more than 20% insufficient. And so we know that benefit outlays would be reduced by more than 20%. You know, we, we haven't faced a situation of precisely what would happen, but um, there would be insufficient revenue to pay the full promised benefits on time. Yeah, so basically when someone is hearing they're not the politicians do not want to make any changes, that it means there will be benefit cuts in possibly the next decade. Like there is there is a ramification to that, it sounds like you're you're trying to point out to people. I'm just curious what what went through your head when you were hearing those kind of statements coming out of the State of the Union. Not political, but just like you say, there's an accounting reality. What what goes through your mind when you hear this new consensus to not make any changes to those programs right now? I mean, you know, of course, the State of the Union is a policy address and a political address, and I'm here for analysis. And so I'm here to tell the Congress and policymakers and more broadly, what are the implications of current law? And current law would involve a reduction in benefits. And in some sense, I'm not, you know, as you can imagine my job, I'm not here to Monday morning quarterback what the president says and no, this word is wrong and that word is wrong. I think you've got, wait, what's it? Glenn Kessler is the, the right, he's the employee. Of the Our host. fact checker. The fact Washington checker, Post. that's it. So he, did, he does that. Pinocchios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He Pinocchios. did that and sometimes he gets it right, sometimes he gets it wrong or incomplete or whatever, but he does his best. I don't um, believe you've gotten any Pinocchios yet, Phil, but I'll, I'll go back and check. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope, I sure hope not. And it, it, I should, actually, it's a good point. If we, we get things wrong. Right, I mean, it, it happens and I can give you examples and we wanna learn from that. 
and, and get it right. And so I, I say that to members, I say that to everyone. If there's something that you don't understand and it's the press, the public, or you think it's just wrong, tell us and we will fix it. And I, I, can I give you just one quick example? We did a cost estimate for a, a legislation that would have um, uh, had built a new museum on the Smithsonian or authorized a new museum, the, uh, uh, the Smithsonian. And uh, the people involved in that would have to go out and raise the money. But our cost estimate was, well, how much would it cost? And we based that on the original proposals for a small, a relatively small museum. Um, in the meantime, the African American History Museum was built on the on the mall. It's you know it's near the Washington Monument, and it's spectacular. You know both physically and um, historically and intellectually, emotionally, it's spectacular. It's large. It's bigger than we what we had in our project projections. A member of Congress pointed this out pointed this out to us that hey. It looks like you're under, you know, your, your cost estimate is too low. And our reaction was, you were right. And so we fixed it. And, um, you know, that's a little one, but we make bigger mistakes as well. And we want to fix those. Yeah, transparency sounds key to CBO credibility. Um, so I want to ask you about two more. You know, at the start of this program, you mentioned the interest and how these interest payments are just getting to be uh, I believe they triple over the next decade in terms of the share of the budget that will be going to interest. And as you say, that's money that can't be used for uh, programs or for tax cuts or for any other purpose. It, it sort of feels, I hate to say wasted, it's going to bondholders, we need to do it, but it, it just um, used the term crowding out the rest of the budget and, and possible investments we can make. Um, can you give a, a sense of is there any hope about reducing that interest burden or is there any hope of um, containing it going going forward how that's you know we've already kind of promised these these bonds so it just feels like one of those that that you really can't do a lot to in the budget how should we think about it oh okay I mean I, I think of it in at least two ways I mean I'll, I'll just give two ways one is the dollars and cents and the you know trajectory it's on it takes time to change that. Um, you know, the, the, the spending's been done, the revenues are set, um, you know, with a, a high debt, debt level and the, the debt level rose substantially with the fiscal response to the pandemic and is set to rise very substantially under current law. That means more interest payments and especially with high, uh, high and rising interest rates that, that increases the, the, um, the debt burden. So there's a bit in which it's baked, you know, it's baked in and it, it it will just, right, we'll need adjustments in the future. There's an, other ways to look at it. And so, for example, there are measures of sustainability. And one could look at, well, what's the real burden of the debt? What I'm talking about is the, you know, the, the, the payments. And, um, you know, this year, again, this is on the, the one pager that I, I keep saying how wonderful our one pager is. Um, the, the, the burden of the debt is going, well, last year it was 475 billion. This year, it's 640 billion. And then it's going up to over 1.4 trillion at the end of the 10 year window. And so that's going from 1.9% of GDP last year, 2.7, 2.4, sorry, 2.4 this year, 3.6 in the, the end of the window. That, that's one way of looking at it. And that's what I've talked about. One could also say, well, but there's inflation and the treasury is paying back nominal, you know, nominal dollars and high inflation. There's a sense in which, well, that's good for the treasury. It's bad for the nation, but the treasury is a bar, is a, borrower and inflation can be good. So some people would inflation adjust um, the, the debt burden. And of course, the danger there is that we know, we certainly have learned in the last year and a half what, you know, what financial markets have long known, that high inflation leads to high interest rates, right? You don't, you don't get, just get high inflation and it's like a freebie. It turns out, it translates into higher, um, higher interest rates. So there's a sense in which saying, well, the real burden of the debt is lower. There's a little bit of a sense of whistling past the graveyard there because yeah. that's like enjoying the benefits of, of um, uh, high inflation. And there was actually, can I just say, there's a question in the chat, which I thought was very interesting about, well, monetizing the debt. Like, well, it, it goes on like every other country in the world and stop worrying about it. Again, I think we've, you know, the last two years have illustrated the challenge that, um, you know, high inflation is pernicious and damaging. It damages American households. It damages us as a society. It's a challenge. It is an economic challenge. And that's the, in some sense, that, that's the danger. And as, you know, in some sense, right, when that happens, 
right, the fiscal response, according to the sort of monetization um, uh, philosophy, would be, well, we need to take fiscal action to, um, to reduce inflation. And obviously, that's just not, that's not happening. And, you know, both practically, it's not happening intellectually. I, I don't think that, um, you know, we, we saw much, much proposals of that. So um, I guess I'm skeptical of the monetization idea. Mm, interesting. Um, so we often, when people look at Congress, they think about uh, there's a lot of inaction, particularly around budget issues. Um, but one of the most interesting things on the horizon is 2025 and the expiration of the individual tax cuts that were passed in 2017, large by Republicans and signed by President Trump. Um, you know, those, a lot of those tax cuts go away at the end of 2025, heading into 2026, and Congress is going to be forced to decide whether to extend those or not. Um, you know, in, in your CBO projections, you're obviously doing current law, so you are projecting as if they would not be extended, as if they, they go away at the end of that 2025 window, and that helps the fiscal picture to, to have more of that tax revenue back. Um, you know, but can you help us think through what happens to the outlook if those don't expire or if the bulk of them are extended by car by congress okay and that's um that as you said that is in our projections under current law um we don't have a new estimate for the dollars involved if those tax cuts were extended in full under our new um, uh, budget projections. That would actually, again, be done by the um, Joint Committee on Taxation. I'm pointing to the ceiling. I'm on the fourth floor of the Ford building. The, the Joint Committee is on the fifth floor. So that's why I'm pointing to the ceiling here. Um, uh, that, would, that would come from them. And um, uh, I, what I can say is that last year, with our last budget update, the costs involved were just short of one percentage point of GDP. And if you, if viewers go to our website and look at the charts that I've mentioned, you can see that, that revenue projections are slated to rise going from 25, 2025 to 2026 by about one percentage point of GDP. And so that, you know, that, that's, it's both a change in economics, but it's, it's a lot of that is um, the, the projection under current law of yeah. those, those tax cuts expiring. And what happens is up to policymakers. And, and we have some experience from the last time, right? The, the um, tax cuts put in place under President Bush in 01 and 03. Um, the President Obama, when he faced a similar situation, you know, much of that was extended, not all of it, but the top rate was, um, you know, was, was not extended. But in substance, the Bush, I, I think most people think of them as now the Bush Obama tax cuts. Right. Um, so we'll, we'll just see what, uh, what happens. Um, I wanted to ask you about a different one uh, that we were chatting about just before we started this uh, presentation, and that's climate change. Mm. Uh, how is CBO incorporating climate change into your reports and, and your estimates? Oh, no, good. Thank you. I'm really glad you asked about that. So we have a, a large program, a you know, large, broad, robust program of work on climate change. And, you know, part of the job here uh, at CBO is to be ready to support the Congress for future legislation. So we spend time thinking about that. Well, what, you know, of course we want to be ready today, but we want our analysis to be ready when Congress gets to an issue. And something like climate change, being able to evaluate that legislation, it, it just takes us time that we want to set up the technical framework and the analytic framework before Congress gets to the issue. And so we started this, I, oh, I started at, um, at CBO as director in June, 2019, and we started this program soon after that, even though I, I, you know, I was pretty confident that climate change legislation was not happening in um, the second half of 2019, uh, but we started the work because it would take us time and to, to get there. And so we have three different things that we're doing on climate change. I'll, I'll just mention quickly, and then I'm gonna, I will answer the question directly. Right? We have mo modeling effort on electric vehicles. We have a modeling effort on the power um, sector, the ele electric generation sector. And then we have a modeling effort on a, the big picture kind of global um, uh, carbon and climate models that one would look at with um, you know, the, the big scale legislation. And so I don't know when the Congress will get to this issue, it's an important issue and, and 
part of our job is to make sure that we're ready to support uh, the Congress. Now, in the meantime, carbon, uh, climate change is in the baseline. Right, so there's a body of evidence that changes in the climate over time affect the economy. They affect the economy in, in different ways. There's agriculture, there's construction, there's storm activity that affects especially coast, coastal regions. You know, for some people, climate change is a positive, right? If you're a farmer in a you know, more northern part of the U.S., it, it might be a positive for you. And again, that's, uh, that's, that's just being complete, and that's important for CBO to be complete. On the whole, Climate change is, is a negative for the U.S. Um, for U.S. productivity and U.S. the U.S. economy, and that means it's a negative for um, the fiscal situation. And so we've got that in the baseline. Uh, it's a very CBO like um, uh, uh, projection. We take the middle scenario of various uh, climate scenarios, right? So what we have done is not to say, well, what's the extreme um, climate scenario? Um, we, we had the middle of the road and we have an impact of that on the fiscal situation and that's in the baseline. So we have that now. And of course we can provide information on other, other scenarios on an extreme scenario. And, and Yeah, that's fascinating. And I guess, can you sort of summarize, you, you describe it as generally a net negative, a, a drag on the economy. Um, uh, is it sort of shaving a couple of percentage points off of GDP, kind of how, how do you think about it in that middle of the road context now? Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, so it's by the, by the end of our long-term budget window, so it's a 30-year budget window, the level of GDP is one percentage point lower as a result of the accumulation of these negatives. So it's, you know, it's, it's a modest amount over time, but it grows and, and reaches 1% of GDP, which is, is a large number, right? GDP is over 25 trillion. And so 1% of a large number, 1% sounds small, but 1% of a, of a very large number is a large, um, uh, is a large number. So, um, uh, and of course the, the damages from climate change grow over time. So yeah. if we went out further than 30 years, one might expect that to inflect upward. Well, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you, your advice to young people who maybe want to get involved in public service and helping our government, but maybe they're turned off by the partisanship they see that sometimes blows up in the media or whatnot. You know, you've carved a unique career in Washington. What would your advice be about ways to get involved that are not maybe as overtly partisan? Uh, uh, you know, look, there are many paths. Mine is a idiosyncratic one is the way I think of it. Um, uh, and there's, there's lots of different ways to be involved. Do things that, that interest you. You know, I'll just say the CBO hires kids, I'm sorry, I have to say kids, right out of college. Um, we have 25 assistant analysts who come and, and make enormous contributions, generally for two or three or four years, and then go off either, either to another job or to graduate school. There's lots of places in, in the federal government that are like that. There's think tanks and BC, BPC, you walk around BPC offices, there's tons of young people around. The same thing in Congress. There's lots of um, jobs on the Hill is a great place to start. So that, that's what I say, follow your interests and your, your, your passion, but your interest and just learn the first, you know, get your first job, make sure you learn something and then, um, you know, follow that where it goes. But there's lots of ways to contribute. I would not be put, you know, so don't let the partisanship and the bickering dissuade you from entering public service because that that's always gonna be there. And um, there's, there's lots of ways to make a contribution. Well, that's a very encouraging note to end on. Phil, thank you so much for your time and thanks to the Bipartisan Policy Center for hosting uh, this really important discussion that unfortunately we'll probably have to have many times in the coming years. Uh, Bill, we'll toss it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Heather and, and Director Swagel. Uh, uh, first of all, this has just been a tremendous discussion. I appreciate it very much. A lot of material covered here, but uh, as uh, Phil has said, there's a lot more in the in the report. Please uh, uh, go to their website and uh, pull down the report. It's it's for for budget geeks and for uh, policy people in general. It's a it's a, a really a wonderful uh, document to, as we go forward. And just on this last point, Heather, I'd like to simply say uh, the same thing as Phil has said. The bipartisan policy center is 
more than happy to provide opportunities for young people wanting to get into public policy. I got into this many years ago. I didn't get rich by it, but I think there are things other than money and when it comes to public policy that are important for the country's future. And yes, do not get discouraged, young folks. This is uh, the partisanship is yes, it's there, but um, uh, the country in its democratic process will clearly survive and we will move forward. Uh, let me just say at the out, uh, closing here at the BPC, we rely on uh, uh, Director Swagel's uh, report uh, for our own analysis of what we call the X date. And um, with this new information that uh, has been issued this week, uh, we will put pen to paper, so to speak. And in the middle of uh, sometime in the middle of next week, we will issue uh, our estimate of the X date going forward. Um, so let me just close by saying uh, uh, beyond the debt limit, um, I think it's been pretty well put out that there are, by this report, that there are major challenges ahead uh, and no surprise coming from the Bipartisan Policy Center. We believe these challenges are best addressed when they are done in a bipartisan way for the future of this country. So once again, Thank you, uh, Heather. Thank you, Phil. Uh, wonderful discussion. Have a good day. Thanks, Bill.